Thanks for joining us on this episode of the KOG, that's the Kingdom of God Entrepreneur Show. And on this episode, Ken Kraft from Hope of the Valley Rescue Mission joins us for a two-part interview that was actually filmed about two weeks before the COVID-19 lockdown for the entire world. So a lot has changed since this episode was filmed. But Ken talks about the vision that God has given him to really make an impact for the homelessness issue in Los Angeles, as well as the areas he's made mistakes in life and he's gotten redemption himself from past failure. So this is a very p powerful episode I would recommend for everybody. So feel free, please, to hit the thumbs up button as well as the subscribe button to be notified of all future episodes. But please share this episode with family and friends through social media, texting, whatever it be, so that we can get the message out there. Because this is a very powerful episode that I know is going to be inspiring, not just to Kingdom of God entrepreneurs, but to everyone. God bless you and thanks for tuning in. But you know, I always think of that, that, that verse in the Old Testament that says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. You know, because anything that ever becomes something starts with a simple thought. It starts with an inspired idea. And then it's like, well, okay. And then, then there's actions. And those actions oftentimes can seem so, um, you know, inconsequential. They're just minor. They're just they're little steps. But you start stringing those little steps together. And then all of a sudden you look behind you and you see, wow, God has really been faithful each step of the way. So we started, as you mentioned, serving a hot meal. That's how the mission started. You know, what we said hope begins with a hot meal. Okay, well, then let's, let's offer a hot, nutritious meal to people that don't have food. Welcome to this episode of the KOG, that is the Kingdom of God Entrepreneur Show. I'm your host, Stephen Harris, and I have a very special guest today by the name of Ken Kraft. Um, he is the founder of Hope of the Valley Rescue Mission in the northern part of Los Angeles, in the San Fernando Valley specifically. And it's such an honor to have Ken here because one, I used to be one of his employees. He was a director of the San Fernando Valley Rescue Mission some years ago, and I had the honor of working for him. And as someone who comes from a theological background uh, myself and then transitioned into business to understand the big picture of life and the practical approach to, to different things God's called us to, Ken was always one of my prime examples because Working for this man, he is the one who got things done. And it's interesting because in, in um, Christianity, oftentimes we find ourselves so concerned about, uh, you know, just wanting to do everything a certain way. And if it doesn't work out, we assume it's just the will of God. But Ken's one of those guys over here who, uh, you know, whether it was issues with the city saying you can't do this or that because the neighbors aren't happy, Ken always found a way to go in and make people happy and uh, to see whatever mission or vision God gave him through. So anyway, that's just a little tidbit of my experience with you, Ken. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you, Stephen, for allowing me to be part of the show, and it's good to see you again. Uh, it's been a while since you left Los Angeles and went back to North Carolina, um, but I'm excited to hear about this program and the wonderful things that God is doing in your life. And, uh, and as for me, you know, I, I continue to work in the homeless service sector here in Los Angeles. Uh, I was a pastor for many years, and uh, and then, but in, through that being a pastor and my spiritual growth and development, and really understanding scriptures, uh, you know, more and more I began to realize how important it was that we, as people of faith, the kingdom of God, that we are concerned about here on earth as well as what takes place in heaven and it's hard for us to look around and see what's happening on earth without saying you know god let us be salt and let us be light here in our generation and so i feel very uh, 
very, a very specific calling at this time to be right here in the middle, in the thick of it here in Los Angeles. Uh, and so I'm excited to be here and to be working in the homeless service sector. Okay. Well, uh, you know, what inspired you as a Christian who's a gifted entrepreneur to specialize in that type of ministry? Because I, I, I knew of you before. I remember when you had uh, that mega church out there. And as a teenager, I used to love going there. I know your brother was a youth pastor, James, and there would be these huge events. I mean, we're talking in Simi Valley, California, there was concerts with like Anybody who's anybody in Christian rock music, like these huge festivals, thousands of people would show up, with these huge name bands, you know, Jars of Clay and Five Iron Frenzy, Staves Acre, all these bands. It was like anything that, that you and your brother were putting your signature on at the time was phenomenal. And then you took that same thing and, and brought it to uh, homeless ministry. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what, again, what inspired you to say, okay, this is, this is where I'm going to put my energy. Well, I, I wish my story was one of pure vision and uh, this is what I hear God saying to me to do. It wasn't quite like that. Um, unfortunately, uh, I've had failure in my life and that failure at times, instead of allowing it to define me, I have allowed it to refine me hmm. and to sometimes redirect me. And wow. so, you know, and I'm very honest with my failures in life. Uh, I was pastoring a very large church, a couple thousand a week in attendance in, over an eight-year period. And unfortunately, I had moral failure. I had an affair. And it cost me everything. And my life shattered. Uh, I went, uh, you know, we'll say from the penthouse to the doghouse. Uh, and uh, everything that was, that surrounded me that oftentimes I would find my identity in was stripped away. I no longer was a pastor. I went through a divorce, so I no longer was a husband. Um, I, I, I didn't, all I had ever known was ministry and training. And now all of a sudden I'm finding myself that these skills don't necessarily translate over and people aren't saying, oh, well, let us, let's hire a, a former pastor right away. And so it was a very dark season of my life where I was really trying to define myself. But yet in that dark season, uh, I discovered a dimension of God's love and grace that I never knew. Uh, and so God graciously carried me through that season. But there was a day, which I'll never forget, I was working for Equifax, a national credit bureau, doing national sales and was doing quite fine. I was making over six figures and I was like, okay, this is okay. You know, I mean, I can do this. And, and uh, the speaking part came naturally in terms of sales. Um, but I received a phone call from the uh, executive director of the Ventura County Rescue Mission. And his name was Jerry Roberg, and, he's, and he had gone to my church, and, and he had said, hey, I want you, uh, he, he was first thing, he goes, have you ever considered working with the poor and the homeless? And I said, no. And, uh, and he said, will you please just come have lunch with me at the mission? Come, come just see what goes on here. And he was a dear friend. So I said, of course. So I went there and I, I, I probably spent three hours with him. And we went from site to site. And, and every time I looked at somebody and, and all these men and the, their lives were broken. And I, uh, I, I cried more that day than I think I'd cried in a long time. And I, I, I left there saying, you know, God, if you see fit to give me a second chance in life like you've given these men, and I'm open for business. God, use me. Well, two days later, Jerry calls me and says, Ken, we're starting something in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, you know, would you be willing to come and lead it? And I'm like, well, what does it pay? And it was a 50% cut in pay. Uh, but it was one of those things I had prayed that prayer, and uh, I remembered that, that quiet oath before God. And I said, Jerry, I'll do it. And I didn't know the first thing about homeless services. That really wasn't even a passion of mine, but I knew God was speaking to my heart and he was directing my footsteps. So I said, yes. And I figured, I mean, how bad can I hurt it? It hasn't even hardly started yet. You know, there's a, it's not like there was a, a big organization in the San Fernando Valley. So I was able to go in there and uh, help build yeah. it from the ground up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And as one who was working there, I just, when you were at the helm of the ship, let's say that, things were always happening and moving forward. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we were sad to see you go when you, uh, you know, you went back. I think you started another church after that. And uh, it, was, it was a night and day difference when you had left, you know, not to just knock, you know, anybody, you know, the people that took over. There was just a different skill set. You know what I mean? 
because yeah. um, you had that natural entrepreneurial approach to things. And, uh, and you think about Billy Graham, you know, in, in Christianity, it's like with modern Christianity, he's like the gold standard of Christian ministers. Sure. But most people don't look at it. Well, he was a, a door-to-door comb salesman or brush salesman, you know? <laughs> right. But he had a persistence about him that, that drove him, but there were practical skills behind what he did. And yeah. you're obviously one of those people that you walk in that. And so it's transferable, whatever context you're in. Yeah. Well, and I think for me, what has always driven me is the need. Yeah. You know, you have to look at the need, but to look at the need, you have to open your eyes yeah. and you have to open your heart and you have to allow yourself to be intimately affected by what you see. Yeah. And so when all of a sudden I found myself the head of a homeless organization, you know, I, of course, I want to be good. I want to be successful. I yeah. want God to prosper what I do. And so there's first that, you know, gaining of knowledge and gaining of understanding and, and getting a lay of the land. And, and, you know, what are, what are some industry best practices? What works? And then really just getting along with God and saying, God, what do you want? And now, fortunately, you know, I, I tend to have more of a gift of faith. Um, you know, I really believe when the Bible says that God desires to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, I believe that. Uh, and when the Bible says, Jesus says, you know, lo, I am with you always. I believe he really is with me always. Yeah. And, and so there, that really helps in confidence and being able to take some risks and some challenges and to, you know, I tell our board right now, our board of directors, I said, the thing about opportunity, it does not announce itself before it knocks. It just knocks. And when opportunity knocks, either you answer the door or you don't. And there have been some incredible opportunities that have knocked on our door. And we could have easily said, you know what, no, now's not the time. We don't have the resources. We don't have the manpower. But we can't do that. We have to look at the need and then look at our God and realize God is more than able to provide. And so there's times I've been out there on a limb and it's like, God, I don't know how you're going to come through on this, uh, but I'm telling you, God has come through every time. Currently, I mean, 10 years ago, I started a new rescue mission, and it's called Hope of the Valley Rescue Mission. And uh, we started with nothing, and uh, we now currently have 12 locations wow. in the San Fernando Valley. We are opening three more in the next five months. In the year 2020, we will double. Um, our bed count right now is 182 year-round beds, and then we have 140 seasonal beds. But in the next four, four, four months, we will actually add an additional 185 beds. And so, uh, and each step of the way, uh, it, it, it does require faith. Uh, it keeps us on our knees. Um, but we also realize how many more people we're going to be able to help. And, uh, and so I just, you know, Part of my posture and my position is just to say, yes, you know, yes, God, you know, if you're going to open up the door, we're going to walk through it. I don't have to know how it's going to, what the ending is going to be or how it's going to all come together. I just want to be faithful and say yes when the doors are opened. Wow. And um, you have uh, at least one thrift store, right? Or is there more? <laughs> well, um, when I was getting ready to start the rescue mission, one of the things that was critical was funding streams. Yes. because it's it's easy to put all your eggs in one basket and then that basket gets a hole and then you're like well we don't have any money and so from the very beginning we worked very diligently and i knew that you know, sometimes you just know things in your heart and, and i just sensed in my spirit this is going to be a very large organization and as a large organization we're going to need to make sure we have various revenue streams so we started off by direct mail Okay. And you know, where you, like a lot of nonprofits do, you rent a list and you mail it out. And then if somebody responds back, then you actually have their information. If they don't respond back, you don't have it because you've only rented the list, but you never actually see the list. Well, in our first 10 years, we've had, our database now has about 50,000 people that have given to the mission in one capacity or another. Wow. Okay. But speaking of thrift stores, okay, I knew that one of the easiest ways for people to partner with homeless services that are not maybe, maybe they're not ready to write a check, but they're ready to clean out their closets, okay? And we can do them a favor. We'll take that for you. Not only will we take it, we'll pick it up and we'll give you a tax receipt for it. 
And so th that's inviting for people, and it connects them to the work of the ministry. So we started off with one thrift store, and then we added another thrift store, and another, and another. We now have four thrift stores, and we're getting ready to open up a fifth thrift store, which will be 17, this one will have to be 17,000 square feet, 40% of our revenue comes from our thrift stores. Wow. Okay, so in this year, I mean, in, in just this last year, our budget has gone from about almost 7 million to this year, it will be almost 13 million. Wow. In one Incredible. So there's been, you know, it's kind of like you're building, you're building, you're building, and you're being faithful, you're being faithful. And then all of a sudden you find, you know what, we're in the right place at the right time. Okay, there, our mayor has declared a state of emergency in the city of Los Angeles. And as I challenged pastors and, 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 and spiritual leaders, listen, if not us, who? If not now, when? This is an incredible opportunity for us to truly impact our generation when the need is so great. And so, you know, I feel this, this compulsion. Um, I feel this need. I feel this desire to, to press the envelope at times. Um, and all you got to do is go walk through one of our family shelters uh, and, and look at the kids and look at the moms. Yeah. We have three family shelters now. Um, but just looking, looking at them and all of a sudden you realize, you know, how can we not move forward and do everything within our power to continue to grow? We don't grow for our sake. We grow for the sake of those that we can serve. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. I mean, I do remember when you had started from scratch, uh, there was um, – one of the, the, the churches that was involved there before, right? I can't remember. They were in like the North Hollywood area, right? And they opened their doors and you started from that. And to hear where you're at, it just blows my mind because I was kind of there at that infancy to see certain steps and just know, um, you know, being in Los Angeles at that time, for me, when I was your um, employee, it was between 2004, 2005. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I got to know the industry, like you're saying, how you have like the chronic homeless, you got the transitional homeless, there was all these different systems, case managers throughout the city, and you learned what was available for people. And as a result, you could tell who's, who's very serious about it being in transition, and who is just there to live life and use the system to their mm -hmm. advantage. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But you are always able to create a medium for people to get on their feet the hand up. And then they would be able to move forward. And um, please, yeah. And I was, you know, and that's that's you know one of our models is you know not not a handout but a hand up. Okay. And uh, you know we want to uh, ina empower people, not enable people. You know one of our models is Hope of the Valley, where everybody and everything gets a second chance. Wow. Okay, so whether that's a thrift store or whether it's for, uh, drug and alcohol recovery. But, you know, I always think of that, that, that verse in the Old Testament that says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. Mm -hmm. You know, because anything that ever becomes something starts with a simple thought. It starts with an inspired idea. And then it's like, well, okay. And then, then there's actions. And those actions oftentimes can seem so, um, you know, inconsequential. They're just minor. They're just they're little steps. But you start stringing those little steps together, and then all of a sudden you look behind you and you see, wow, God has really been faithful each step of the way. So we started, as you mentioned, serving a hot meal. That's how the mission started. You know, we said hope begins with a hot meal. Okay, well, then let's, let's offer a hot, nutritious meal to people that don't have food. And out of that, then we started saying, man, there's a lot of these folks that are actually struggling with substance abuse, drug and alcohol. Wow. And so we ended up, we had a, a, you know, one of our donors who said, listen, I'm, I'm going to help you get this, uh, this residential facility. And we opened up the House of Hope, uh, which is our men's drug and alcohol recovery program. And then after that, then I had another donor who said to me, hey, Ken, you know what? I've got this property that might interest you. It's 10 bedrooms, nine bathrooms. It was built by the Catholic Archdiocese in the 1950s. Wow. Um, it's run into disrepair, but go look at it. So I went there. There were squatters living in it. It was a drug house, but I could see the vision. I mean, this house could be, you know, reformed. And so I reached out to California home builders, a local contractor. They put in $230,000, and we created one of the finest 
family shelters in LA County. It is absolutely beautiful. Wow. And then from there, we started cold weather shelters. We spent $4.3 million and created the very first recuperative care shelter for homeless individuals being discharged from hospitals. As I mentioned, we now have three family shelters. We also have a youth shelter for those that are timing out of foster care. I mean, that's another heartbreak issue. Individuals that time out of foster care they have nowhere to go. They don't have a family structure. So many of them, unfortunately, end up selling their bodies or, or selling drugs. And so we're able to bring them in and to love them and to help them and to coach them and to mentor them. And, uh, and, and so we have our access centers, which has 150 people a day that are coming to receive services. Um, just this Monday, uh, we're opening up a new access center in North Hollywood that will actually have storage bins as well okay. 120 storage bins because sometimes when people are homeless they don't know where to put their stuff and I know people outside of Los Angeles might say well just put them into housing but here's the problem we don't have housing we do not have affordable housing we have individuals that we are working with that genuinely want to get off of the streets but unfortunately sometimes even though they're willing we're working, it'll take us five to six months to find a bed for them. Thus, there is this massive push in Los Angeles to build transitional and permanent supportive housing. And I realize to the rest of the world, you might look at it and think, well, man, you guys got yourself in a horrible situation and you know, it seems like it's going, getting worse. But I genuinely believe, okay, over the next 12 months, we will hit the tipping point and we'll start to see it go down. Why? Because there, I know right now there are 29 housing projects in the queue, okay? And that's just for bridge housing. That's not the permanent supportive housing. And so I realize all of these are very practical solutions, which you have to have practical. But I think the beautiful thing is, like Hope of the Valley, is it's not just practical. It's practical plus faith in realizing that, you know, yeah, you need bread but you need the bread of life. And yeah, so you, know, yeah. you might think your deepest need is a pillow, but it really is a savior. You know, so we're able to kind of incorporate uh, all of that working together as the faith-based organization. Okay, wow. You know, that's, that's powerful because sometimes um, here in North Carolina, I'll, I'll YouTube or, or just see the, the mainstream media news and there's this microscope over Los Angeles right now, this phenomena of homelessness. It's like San Francisco and LA are the two hotbeds of homelessness. Mm -hmm. And when I'm seeing Northridge, you know, you have the, the train station there in Northridge, which is real close to where I grew up in Granada Hills. I mean, you know, bike ride distance mm -hmm. to find out that this has become a huge camping facility for, uh, for homeless people. It just blows my mind because that just did not exist my whole right. life. Right. And now the whole country, you know, I guess the whole world in a sense, is looking at L.A. saying, what's going on? And, and it's like God is using you not only to meet the practical needs of all these people that are in need of transition and, and you know, shelter, food, and all those things, but you're there helping to restore the credibility of the City of Angels. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, would you be willing to speak on that at all? Yeah. yeah. But you're there helping to restore the credibility of the City of Angels. Mm. And I mean, would you be willing to speak on that at all? Just yeah. there helping to restore the credibility of the city of angels mm. and i mean would you be willing to speak on that at all just yeah you know, i mean yeah without a doubt 
we have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I think the only way to solve a problem is to first of all, own it uh, and, and to be realistic. You know, I mean, if we somehow paint this picture that, oh, it's not really that bad. It is that bad. Okay. I mean, there are close to 70,000 homeless people on any given night in Los Angeles. Okay. Wow. And, uh, and, and there's been some initiatives that have been launched. You know, you have these bond measures, okay? There was what's called Triple H bond measure, which was to, is generating $1.2 billion to create 10,000 units of affordable housing. And then you have another bond measure, the H bond measure, which was to, I think it was 800 million to, for the wraparound services. And so what happened is the mayor, a number of years ago when we realized, okay, doing nothing is not an option and doing things the way we're doing it is not going to ever change anything. And so we have to be aggressive and proactive. So when the mayor declared the state of emergency, it, it did some things that even helped us. Um, in other words, it loosened the zoning regulations because bef before he declared the state of emergency, you could only open an emergency shelter okay, in a zoning that was a C2 or CM commercial manufacturing commercial. Um, and you could only have it for 30 beds or less. And, and, and if you went above 30 beds, you'd have to get a conditional use permit in the variance. Oh, wow. but there was tremendous pushback because nobody wanted it. So with this, uh, the mayor declaring the state of emergency, now we can open them in manufacturing zones. So right now we are building an 85 bed year round shelter in North Hollywood mm -hmm. in a manufacturing zone. All right, and then we're also going to, and then in the summer, we're going to be opening up a 100 bed shelter in Van Nuys. And so, the pro, I mean, it, like anything, whenever you're building something, you have to go down before you go up. And I think in the homeless service sector, the past two to three years, there's been a tremendous amount of infrastructure being put in place to be able to grow the, the numbers of beds, the facilities, the resources the infrastructure. And I think most people from the outside, they would look at it, and I would too. If I didn't know the inner workings, I would think, man, why? Because last year's homeless count, yeah. homelessness went up 16% in Los Angeles, despite the passing of these bond measures. Why? Because only one of the projects had come online. This year alone, we will have over 25 to 26 projects coming online, just in the bridge housing. And in the San Fernando Valley, uh, this year we'll have one, two, three, four, four, five, five new projects coming online. So wow. that makes a huge difference. Okay. I mean, there are actually more beds that are coming online now than there was available in the previous 30 years. Wow. Okay. So okay. There's a, and, and, but here's the, here's the challenge that we have. Currently, you have 100, you know, I was speaking to a group of pastors recently, and I said, I have great news for you. I said, every day in the city of Los Angeles, we are able to house 130 people, getting them off the street, getting them into permanent housing, and everybody clapped and cheered. I said, now here's the bad news. Every day in the city of Los Angeles, 150 people become homeless. So we're losing the battle. Even though we've never been more successful in housing more people, 130 people a day, we've never had more people becoming homeless. And so that, and that's the affordable housing issue. Okay, yes, there is substance abuse issues. There's mental health issues. There's domestic violence issues. There's many things that play into this. But when you have that disparity, we have to increase the number of affordable beds. Okay, in, in affordable housing. And so there's a, a lot of effort that's going into that. I know sometimes it's, um, it, it can be easy to criticize government. Okay, I have, to, I have to check my own heart sometimes and monitor my own mouth. Um, but I, I must say, um, I, I work with the, I'm working with the mayor's office. I work with city council members. Um, I, I work with a lot of other organizations and agencies. And there's a lot of really good people working very hard uh, to try to turn the tide. And uh, I genuinely believe over the next 12 to 24 months, you're going to see a huge change in the city of Los Angeles. If not, call me back on and call me out on it. <laughs> I hope I don't have to do that. And I probably <laughs> wouldn't even if I wanted to. <laughs> wow. No, that's profound. I, I, because in one sense, there's a part of me that's hearing what you're saying as even though you could take the guy out of L.A., you can't take the L.A. out of the guy, right? I'm, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina now, but I'm still very much an L.A. guy. 
And when I see these things on the news, it hurts me because again, I've worked in the industry. I spent over two years of my life. That was my full-time job. I, I mean, you know, when you're dealing with having to break up fights and just, you have to put people out because of breaking rules. These kinds of things are very hard and very few people can do that job. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that city has an infrastructure in place to confront the issue. The problem is, like you're saying, the issue got so big that it's just flooding the system and the whole thing has to be restructured. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I yeah. work, like I mentioned, you know, working with uh, the, the various entities, like yesterday I met with one of the, uh, the council members, one that would have been your council member in your district in Northridge, John Lee, who was just okay. reelected. Okay. And I went into his office and I, and, and I had an agenda and I said, you know, John, well, now that you're elected, um, I think uh, let, let's see what we can do. Uh, we need to create some um, shelter here in CD12, Council District 12. And, and I began to lay out the various options for him and what could be done. And, and, and I think that's part of what we have to do. You know, we as entrepreneurs, we have to think ahead. Yep. We have to think of solutions. Nobody wants to hear complaints. Okay, we already know what's wrong, all right? And so an entrepreneur doesn't just come in and say what's wrong. We might identify what's wrong, but then say, here's a solution, and here's a possibility. So I presented him with multiple buildings that could be used to be converted into a year-round shelter. I talked about creating cold weather shelter in the West San Fernando Valley. I talked about safe parking in the West San Fernando Valley and, uh, and an access center in San, West San Fernando Valley. And so he was very open, and uh, so I, and I told him, I said, look, I said, John, I don't want to spin my wheels. If you're not going to be behind this and, and, and help, you know, put your blessing on it, then, then I'm going to spend my efforts elsewhere. But if you're open to it, then I'll pour myself into it and I'll bring back to you solutions that I think are really viable solutions. And he said, absolutely. He goes, can we need this? At another point he had said to me, can I need you to open something in my district? And so, you know, when you have that kind of favor, uh, and, and that, and that I think is, is critical. Um, you know, as entrepreneurs, somebody once said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Okay. Wow. We can't do this on our own and it can't be us against them. And now as a, uh, as a faith-based organization, we do take government money. Now I realize that can be controversial to some, uh, but one of the things that I did before we ever took one dollar of government money, I called the main agency, which is called LASA, which is the Los Angeles Housing Services Authority, and I asked them, I said, please, can you tell me exactly what are the restrictions that would be placed upon us if we receive these government dollars? And they said, yes. Number one, you cannot discriminate against people. And number two, you cannot require that somebody has to do something in order to receive services. I said, okay. You know, and, and personally, I don't have a problem with that. You know what? I'm not going to discriminate against people. I'm going to love people. You know, I, I often think if, if somebody is drowning in the middle of the ocean and I drive up and I, pull, I have a boat and I have a life preserver, am I going to say, listen, buddy, before I throw you this life preserver, I, I need to know your history. You know, what's your faith? You know, um, you know, tell me your worst mistakes. No, I'm going to throw a life preserver and I'm going to rescue that person and then we can begin to work with them. And so to me, it, it is a kingdom of God issue. Okay. In other words, I could say, you know, no, you know, we're not going to touch that money because that, that would cause us to compromise our faith, which I don't believe it does. Okay. But if I took that stance, then we would be one tenth probably of the size we are right now. But we've been able to say, no, I believe in public-private partnership. And I also believe that when Jesus said, whosoever will come, that Jesus was opening the gates wide. And, and he would have never said, listen, before I, you know, you multitudes, before I feed the 5,000, you know, I just need to know that, you know, you all need to pray a prayer of salvation first. That wasn't the case. You know, he, wow. so engaging. And so we find by giving people that opportunity, and we have a lot of church groups and faith groups that will come, but we do everything on an opt-in basis. And so it's like, listen, you know, um, 
we have this church group here. If you would like prayer tonight, they're going to be right over here. We're actually going to have a night, some worship right over here. We're going to have a Bible study right over here. And you would be surprised how many people say, yes, count me in. Man, when you're at the bottom, you're looking up. And so we have this incredible opportunity um, to expand. And, and as a matter of fact, like the one shelter we're building right now, the city of Los Angeles, they're paying the $3.4 million to renovate this warehouse. And wow. you know what we have to do? We, I signed this uh, letter of agreement that will guarantee that we'll use it for three years for homeless services. After that three-year period, I don't owe them nothing. And if wow. we wanted to, we could do something different. I don't plan on it. But my point is, is wow. do you know how long it takes to raise $3.4 million? Oh, wow. um, as opposed to right now, they're saying, Ken, we love what you're doing. We want to partner with you. We know you're a faith-based organization, and we know you'll get it done. And so they said, we don't normally do this, but they said, you build it, and we'll pay for it. And, uh, and that's exactly what's happening right now. Wow. What's that saying is, is your your gift will open doors for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you just did in that lane this whole time. And then all of a sudden the need is so big. They're like, please, you're the expert. Please do this. That's phenomenal. Wow. It makes me so happy to hear that. And, and, and you know, and, and again, having a, a few years in that, that industry, though I worked for you, you know, I was exposed to the system as a whole and the different places. And I can't think of anybody else. It's almost like with Joseph, he was the perfect guy for the job. And that's, pretty much my bias mm. opinion about you is, you know, you really are that guy. That's phenomenal. Wow. Oh, thank you. I, one of the, somebody once told me a moment of favor is better than a lifetime of labor. Wow. And, and I like that. And I believe that. And wow. it's so much more powerful when God's favor, you know, opens up doors you know, gives you that, that, that right meeting, that right opportunity, the right resource, um, you know, and resources are huge because you can't do what we do. I tell people all the time, homeless services is expensive. Yeah. It's expensive. Why? It's not like a food bank. A food bank, you can, you know, you open it at 9 a.m., you close your doors at 5 p.m., you have a lot of volunteers that are assembling things. Okay, but in homeless services, we have to have case managers, we have to have housing navigators, we have to have housing stabilizers, we have to have security guards, we have to have 24-7 coverage, okay? So it is actually very expensive. Yeah. And, and so one of the things that our board did for me, because they know I'm an entrepreneur, okay, but I I have to surround myself with people that are very different from me because if everybody was like me, we'd be in trouble. Okay. Because I'm definitely an accelerator. So I have to surround myself with breaks. Okay. With people that are very logical, that are very intentional, um, that are not very emotional. Okay. I have to do that because I, I tend to be very passionate and, uh, and I, I want to go, 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 go. Um, and so I recently brought this opportunity before them and, uh, which is this North Hollywood shelter. And they said, okay, Ken, even though the government's going to be helping with this, you know as well as I do that there is a tremendous lag time before the government will pay for things, sometimes 90, 120 days. And how in the world are we going to float that? Uh, because we've, we've run into cash flow issues in the past. And so they, they said this, okay, here's the deal, Ken. We think it's a great idea. But before we say yes, you're going to have to raise $400,000 in order to create that cash flow. Uh, that we would have to have uh, so that it doesn't impact the organization. And I'm like, oh my gosh, $400,000. This is, you know, uh, and I didn't know where it's going to come from. I'm already fan fundraising every day. So where am I going to find an additional $400,000? Well, yeah. we had our 10 year gala, which was coming up. I had just built relationship with the owner of Beachbody, okay, which is a very successful online PX90 yeah. um, exercise company. And uh, excuse me. And, uh, I had just built the relationship with him, and but I just felt in my heart, I, I need to ask him. And so I sent him an email because I, I wanted him to have time to process. And I said, you know, would you consider, I need to raise these $400,000. And I explained why. And I said, would you give the lead gift of $200,000? And I didn't hear from him for a while. Uh, and then the day of the event, he gets in touch with me and he says, I'll do it, 200000 And then I had the opportunity to stand before everybody that was at our gala and, and, I, and I said, we need to raise $400,000 tonight. And you can see people just like gulping. And I said, but I got great news for you. 200000 was already given this morning. And I had somebody else that said, listen, if you can, if you can raise the other, other 100000 in the room here tonight, I will double it. 
Wow. And, and we raised $400,000 in one night. The next day I signed the lease uh, and we were moving forward with this uh, new facility in North Hollywood. Wow, that's phenomenal. <laughs> God is good. Yeah, yeah. There's a part of me thinking only in LA, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so it's awesome. pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, that, that will bring up the last question. So how can people, whether they're in Los Angeles or anywhere else in the world, they're seeing this podcast or listening to the audio, what can we do, the audience, to help your cause specifically? And I don't say this flippantly, but, but we, we all know that prayer works. Yeah. And prayer is such a powerful force. Um, you know, we still have a lot of challenges within just the bureaucracy of the city that yeah. can sometimes prevent things from moving forward the way they need to move forward. You know, we, we're, we live in the United States of America. If we want to put somebody on the moon, we're going to put somebody on the moon. Okay, we're going to find a way to do that. And it's like, if we want to end homelessness, we can end homelessness. Okay, it is not rocket science. We can do it. But there has to be the political will. And so that's, that's really, but that's a matter of prayer because God can direct the hearts of kings. God can direct the hearts of city council members. God can do that. So, you know, prayer that, that hearts would be softened because not everybody, you know, there are some council members that don't want facilities in their council district, which creates challenges. Okay. So there's that. And then, you know, as I mentioned before, resources are always a key issue. And I realize there's a lot of charities, a lot of nonprofits that are, always asking for money. And um, all I can say is this, I know that 82% of every dollar that is given to Hope Valley goes directly towards programs. And that's really good. And we also do raise a lot of our own money, you know, 40% of it through our thrift stores. And so if anybody wanted to give, they could just go to hopeofthevalley.org and they could make a contribution and it's a charitable contribution. We're a 501c3. And, uh, and I'll make sure that that money gets used to provide, um, you know, the critical resources for those that are in need. Because at Hope of the Valley, our mission is very clear. We exist to prevent, reduce, and eliminate poverty, hunger, and homelessness by tangibly demonstrating God's love through immediate assistance and long-term solutions. That's what we're committed to doing. Wow. Well, amen. That, that uh, was so much wisdom, and uh, there's just so many nuggets of just principles uh, and practical approaches to not just what you're, you're doing in L.A., but just as entrepreneurs. You know, you said things that are very much keys that we can use as people who are trying to be entrepreneurs or just trying to better the situation God's given us dominion in, you know what I mean? And so, wow, this is, this is incredible. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I know you have a, a very busy schedule and I, I definitely want to let you go, but would you uh, mind closing us out in a prayer and maybe praying for our audience who are in pursuit of what God has called them to do as entrepreneurs? Yes, would love to. Thank you, Stephen. God, thank you for this moment. And thank you for your spirit that is alive and well in the hearts of your people. And Lord, I know that you have called many of the listeners that are even watching this broadcast, that you've called them to something great. You've called them them to significance. You've called them to break down walls and barriers. You've called them to do the impossible. And I pray, God, you really would raise up a generation of Nehemiahs, ones that are willing to take great risks, yeah. personal sacrifice, and to accomplish great things. And so, Lord, I just pray, God, that you would raise up this generation to be uh, people of action, to be people of intent, people of passion, and people of purpose. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, Mr. Ken Kraft, it was such an honor to have you today. I want to thank you for your time. We're going to have um, uh, all the information available and links to click on for our viewers to be able to give and learn more about what you're doing. But again, thank you for coming uh, and being a part of the podcast today. And God bless you, sir. Great. Thank you, Steve. <laughs>
never want to put limits on people. And so what I will say is sometimes I'll be brutally honest about where they're at in their current um, state of being, so to speak, but I will always point people to who they can be. And that's really the, the nature of God himself, is I believe God is someone who wants to draw out the best in us. He doesn't ever want us to settle. He doesn't want us just to stay the same and be stagnant and be settled and happy and comfortable. He wants to stretch us. Yeah. And if you look at the New Testament, it's constant stretching. It's constant challenges. And so here we are in the West. Here we are in 2020. And we have all these tools and resources at our disposal. And I can think of the saints looking down at us and saying, what are you doing? You have everything you could ever want. And you're sitting on your butt. I'm Stephen Harris, your host, and this is the next episode of the KOG, that's the Kingdom of God Entrepreneur Show. Now today, I have a special guest who is a friend of mine who I've known for the last couple of years. We actually used to go to church together, and Mr. Chris Honeycutt of Realm Solutions is here with us today, and first and foremost, I want to say hello and welcome to the show, Chris. How are you doing today? Hey man, great to see you. Great to be on the show. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, so going back a little bit of how I know you, about two years ago, me and my wife, Lois, were living in the Columbia, South Carolina area, and we joined a local church that was a, an Assembly of God church. And Chris here was the campus pastor at the time. And he wasn't just doing normal pastoral duties. The thing that, that really got my attention and, and made me want to want to have uh, Chris on, on the show today is that I saw he was a living, breathing kingdom of entrepreneur. So as we were there week after week, Chris would have his cameras there, like video cameras, and he would have this whole marketing strategy. And take it, this was a church plant. <laughs> And yeah, there was a lot of different factors involved. The, the, the founding pastor, he was a great preacher, great communicator, and there was a team effort. But what Chris was doing with the marketing really made a difference because here you are a church with maybe a dozen people. And within a couple of months, the most I saw it while you were still doing your job was, you know, as a pastor was like 60 people. And that was in a couple of months. And for a church plant, that is almost unheard of. So anyway, I've been a fan for the last couple of years because I've seen your action. Or your, your, you know, I've seen you putting your faith to action. And I've seen, uh, you know, just how effective it can be in such a short amount of time. So anyway, that's my introdu introduction to uh, knowing you, sir. How are you? Tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Well, uh, for the past five years, I've been doing uh, coaching and also doing uh, a lot of things when it comes to working with organizations, businesses, churches, when it comes to uh, leadership development, and also uh, with their digital marketing presence. And so helping organizations realize that before you touch the marketing side, you need to look at, do you have something worth marketing? Hmm. Do you have something that's healthy, that's strong, that is something that you want the public to know about. Hmm. And uh, as we were talking in kind of the pre-interview, is so many organizations make the mistake of wanting to uh, rush over to the marketing side of things. And they think they're ready for prime time when uh, me and my team get on the scene. It's sometimes far from that. Hmm. And so usually I'm the one to hit the brakes and say, you know what, let's have some healthy processes in place hmm before we start uh, broadcasting everything, so to speak. And so that's kind of the inside of and out approach of what Realm Solutions uh, provides our clients. And so I've been also able to do that uh, with my coaching clients that 
uh, before uh, our team will build a website for you or do a promo video for you, uh, we really want you to have a grasp on your business approach. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, so it's almost like this organic, let's deal with the foundation first, and then from there we can really build because you want to make sure that the inside of the cup is right and not just the outside of the cup looking pretty, right? That's right. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah, and that, that's interesting because we're kind of seeing this move of God in the entrepreneurial realm. And uh, like the group I'm with, 100X, they talk about this kind of sozo cleansing. It's almost like you need to do your own internal spiritual warfare in the sense of what are the, the things that uh, you're seeing the world through those lenses. You know what I mean? What right. are your experiences? What are your traumas? What are the, the times where injustices has happened to you? And are you marketing yourself based on that foundation or are you allowing the Lord to come in and cleanse that first, then you can build the outside. And it sounds like that's exactly what your whole strategy and approach has been from day one. Am I yeah. Right? And so that approach is, is nothing new, but just with many other things and, and wisdom, uh, people probably know what they should do, but they, they uh, maybe by their human nature, they do another thing. And so, it's just reinforcement of healthy habits and healthy approaches uh, that a consulting group like ours, we're really there just to kind of reinforce the good. And, and say we are uh, brought in by a senior pastor of a church or a, the small business owner, uh, it's really where they probably already have a good idea of what the goals uh, they want for their organization. Maybe if they have a vision for their organization and sometimes they feel like, uh, they're having a hard time implementing some of the changes they want to see. And so bringing in an outside group like ours, we help reinforce that vision. We reinforce all those changes that they're wanting to bring in because it's uh, one of those things that people often uh, tune you out after, after a while. Uh, basically, when you uh, have been hammering down on certain things, like what, things you want to see, happen in your organization, sometimes people get weary of that. But when you have someone else come in, a third party come in to, to reinforce these things, they're saying, wow, that sounds like a great idea. And the, sometimes the pastor or the small business owner is like, well, actually, I brought that up, you know, two months ago. Yeah. And so <laughs> it's, again, where it's just a smart approach. It's a smart strategy to bring in an outside voice that can say, you know what? this is where we see things and this is an approach we think would be a, a healthy approach to take. And so that's where, again, we really uh, find our niche in reinforcing the good and finding healthy processes for organizations. And then we take it to that next level. That's when we really have some really cool creative strategies on getting your business out there, getting your church out there. Uh, this is something where, again, there's things like Google SEO that we tap into. Uh, there's different approaches you can take with things like Facebook ads, yeah. uh, all sorts of stuff like that that are always changing. The algorithms always are changing, and you need someone that has their finger on that pulse. Yeah. Uh, and so many people just don't uh, live in that space. They don't, they're not part of that world, and so they need someone else to kind of bring them up to speed. Yeah, awesome. Well, um, as far as your journey to this point, because when you're speaking this, it's, it's impressive how fluid you are. You just sat down and just flowed with these thoughts because you obviously are an expert in this realm. <laughs> but to, uh, I mean, just from my experience, and again, this, the wisdom you're speaking, it's just kind of like this is, this is what's going on and this is how we attack it. And that, that's brilliant. I love it. Well, something that I pride myself in is I surround myself with good people. Yeah. And uh, I always want the best people working for me. It's kind of like similar to what a good CEO or even a president does with his cabinet. He's going to hire the smartest people. Yeah. And uh, just like with Pastor Randy with Vive, you know, I can't take a lot of credit for that because it's where he brought me in to do those things. He had the awareness to do that. And so, um, and so Vive Church there in Columbia, they're doing some good stuff. 
And so we're glad to be uh, ministry partners with them. And a lot of the things that we did there in Chapin and I've done in other churches, we're actually doing now in Myrtle Beach. And that's kind of my other venture that we're uh, blessed to be a part of is Forward uh, Myrtle Beach. It's a new church plant with the Assemblies of God launching this fall. And we're excited about that. Awesome. We're excited for you, definitely. So please uh, let us know, you as an entrepreneur, what inspired you to not be the W-2 collecting guy? Not that there's anything wrong with that, but what made you say, this is not who I am. I need to do the things that God has put on my heart to do. Yeah, it's one of those things. I, I wrote about this yesterday, actually, where we hear so many times of the word risk and how these different things seem so risky. Uh, and whether it's being an entrepreneur or a church planter. And uh, I remember when I proposed to my wife, mm -hmm. we were only dating for six months. To me at the time, that seemed like a long time. I was waiting my time. But uh, to my mom at the time, that seemed like we were rushing things. She was just horrified. And she was just saying, well, hey, you're just a youth pastor. You don't make a lot of money, all this kind of stuff. This is my mom talking. You think my mom would be the proud <laughs> mother. And what this all is to say is like, even those that seem like they're in your corner, they don't understand a lot of times because they're not living in that space. They're not part of that world. And so I've always been uh, a risk taker. And so that's part, probably – Part of the reason why I'm so um, in line with entrepreneurship and the 1099 life is because, you know what, I don't mind taking a risk with see, because I see the potential. Yes. I'm always one to go off of people's potential rather than their past. And a quote that I, I really have been in tune with is from uh, John Maxwell. He says this, take a risk when the potential for significance is high. So many people play it safe. And how can you play it even uh, the most safest by living by the W-2, by getting the benefits, by uh, having that set salary? But what people don't realize is they're also capping their potential. Yes. And, and so one thing that I always encourage people is when they're assessing opportunities is, uh, is this the the limit of your potential, or at least pretty close to it, or is this something uh, that is going to free you up? And so it's always where, again, we want people to start thinking in that way because, you know what, we have so many poverty mindsets out there that even if they're making, let's say, forty or 50000 a year, uh, that sounds like maybe a decent amount of money here in South Carolina. In California, that's part-time wage. <laughs> the co as far as a cost of living standard. And so there more than I ever made when I lived in California. Oh, man. I, <laughs> you probably were living in a cardboard box. Then. Uh, well, I was living in mom and dad's house. <laughs> you know, someone but, had a spare room for me, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, and so that goes to show is where we have certain numbers in our head. And when we hit that number, we just like almost, uh, we almost die in the sense of, Hey, okay, we hit our plateau. Now we're good. And like, I just don't understand that. Wow. Uh, I've bad, always yeah. been one to say, you know what, what is my potential? What can I do beyond what's expected of me? Because one of the things that I always had to deal with were people trying to tell me what I uh, need to stick with. Yeah. I once had a, a pastor who was very well-meaning when I was a youth pastor and our youth group was out drawing uh, the actual church <laughs> in a lot of ways. And, and so our youth group was just exploding, but uh, the board wasn't ready for that. And they were uh, uncomfortable with a lot of the things I was doing. And so they had the pastor kind of do their bidding and uh, he was basically trying to tell me that, you know, a lot of things I'm doing just aren't, jiving with the board and you know uh, if you're ever going to be a senior pastor someday you really have to respect and honor your leadership and you know you're more cut out for maybe an associate pastor 
<laughs> and this guy was well meaning. He was trying to encourage me and tell me, you know, where I need to focus on. And so I remember at that day that did not resonate with me. Yes. That was something where, again, I felt like because maybe um, someone had got to him at some point and he had been beaten down and sure enough, he got fired two years by that same board after I had, oh, wow. uh, it's the same thing where again, I never want to put limits on people. Yeah. And so what I will say is sometimes I'll be brutally honest about where they're at in their current, um, state of being, so to speak, but I will always point people to who they can be. And that's really the, the nature of God himself is I believe God is someone who wants to draw out the best in us. He doesn't ever want us to settle. He doesn't want us just to stay the same and be stagnant and be settled and happy and comfortable. He wants to stretch us. Yeah. And if you look at the New Testament, it's constant stretching. It's constant challenges. And so here we are in the West. Here we are in 2020. And we have all these tools and resources at our disposal. And I can think of the saints looking down at us and saying, what are you doing? You have everything you could ever want. And you're sitting on your butt. Hmm. Wow. And, and here you had Paul in chains, but so many people uh, have chains on their brain. Hmm. They, they are limiting themselves because, again, they don't have growth mindsets. They have a poverty mindset. Yep. They want to be settled. They want to be taken care of rather than go that extra mile. And you know what? They can be blessings to other people. Hmm. And that's kind of the, the misnomer about entrepreneurs in the first place is that we're selfish, that we're only thinking of ourselves. You know what? Because yeah. I get to do what I do, I'm able to plant churches. I'm able to have flexibility in life. We are loving life here at the beach. And you know what? We wouldn't be able to make these kind of moves if uh, my wife and I didn't make a lot of the decisions we, we made. So this is something where I want to encourage uh, anybody watching this today is that, you know what? You have potential. Amen. And God has put something in you that can grow, a seed, if you will, a seed of greatness. Mm -hmm. And don't let other people that have limited mindsets themselves, that are in poverty themselves, tell you what you can or can't be. Yep. You really have to trust the voice of God. Thankfully, I had already had a calling on my life of what I was going to be. And uh, I had encouragement from the right people that were going to say, you know what, just keep pushing. Just keep going. That, uh, you know what, this, this opportunity... Uh, was just a stepping stone to something even better. Man, wow, that's profound. Wow, that's uh, we could literally stop this interview here, and I would be full with all that wisdom. That that that's that's deep. Um, yeah, it, it is interesting that when you said about how people see entrepreneurs as being selfish, and um, it's almost like you're looked at as 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 seeing yourself as above others and being arrogant. I, I know that's something that I've you're been greedy. in the past. Yeah. You're greedy. You're a capitalist pig, all this kind of stuff. Oh well, yeah. You know, and even in ministry, it's one of those things. It's what you, when you were telling your story about the limitations, because I started my ministry experience as a youth pastor as well. And I had a wonderful pastor at the time, but he kept pushing me in a direction that I was just like, Hey man, I'm like, I'm working a part-time job, not because I want to work part-time. It's because I want to have the energy to do this and to do it effectively. And the, the, the pressures were being put on me because God just didn't wire me that way. It's not yeah. that the desire to make me the, the, the best youth pastor in LA or whatever was, was a bad one for the pastor to have for me, but there was just something that never sat well with me because I knew what I'm doing now Eventually, here we are, you know, what, 16 years later is more what God was pushing me. And I just didn't have the foresight or the experience. Technology hadn't caught up to what it is now. But anyway. Oh, yeah, and that's the point I'm making is, yeah. what is our excuse now? <laughs> exactly. Wow. 
Wow, wow, wow. So again, you're here, you have a kingdom business. Now, how does the kingdom of God specifically benefit from what you're doing right now? Well, it's really for us, um, you know, let's, let's go back to the church market. We have a, a subcategory for Realm Solutions called Training Churches. Yeah. And so uh, we've helped uh, over 150 churches with various different projects and um, different uh, things that, again, they need. And, and a lot of times, unfortunately, where we lay everything out pretty clearly and, and the client doesn't take it. Uh, they don't either opt for that extra service or they don't opt for this package that we've, we've put together for them. Uh, and what they end up doing is they, they do something themselves with, uh, let's just say, uh, with mixed results. Hmm. And so what, again, what we offer is uh, someone to hold your hand through a process. What most people need is, you know, taking the coaching mindset. A coach doesn't necessarily give you all the answers. In fact, a, a proper coach is someone that helps you process. And so, so many times, going back to that poverty mentality or growth mindset, a poverty mentality is a settled mind. They already think they have all the answers. A growth mindset is someone that is able to receive. Yep. And so someone who truly is sincere about wanting to grow their business, grow their church, or grow even as an individual, they're going to not be threatened by questions. They're not going to feel challenged in a bad way uh, when someone points out something and says, you know, have you kept your eye on this? Mm -hmm. uh, it's really about... What we do is where we want to raise the level of excellence in organizations. And so for that subcategory for churches is where we have gone in and we've done some really cool things and we've seen some good results. But then unfortunately, unfortunately you do see a lot of clients that they do not implement what we have put together for them and they're still spinning their wheels. Uh, yep. And so the, the, I guess you would say the potential impact we have for the kingdom of God, it's hard to measure, but it's where by raising that bar, by raising that level of uh, expectation and excellence, it's where, you know what, they're seen as a more stronger organization, seen as more of a healthier church in that case. Uh, and people are drawn to strength. They're not drawn to weakness that instinctively people want to be part of really strong, healthy organizations. It's, it's almost like high school all over again. Everybody wants to be part of the, the popular kids yep. click, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and they may not feel they, they can get there, but instinctively, whether they say it or not, they would like to be a popular kid. Uh, they would like to get invited to all the parties and, and stuff like that. So the same thing is true with business. Same thing is true with churches that, unhealthy organizations have a hard time retaining people. You can do a lot of things well, but if it's just dysfunctional, hmm. that at some point people are going to leave. Yep. Uh, and this is where, again, you need someone with a different set of eyes and a different set of ears. And they can bring, in our case, what we would do with an on-site assessment is like being a secret shopper or a, uh, a pretend first time guest at your church. Uh, we're coming in there with fresh eyes. We're able to take a look and see what is, are they doing to receive this guest? Uh, what are their processes and what is it they're doing well? What are, are the things they're not doing so well? Uh, what are the things that uh, have life to them? And so one of those things I like to say for a church, it's what is their follow-up process like? You know, if they are receiving guests well, you can have the, the kindest, nicest greeters out there. But if you don't have someone uh, making that phone call or sending a, a postcard or letter, doing some follow-up and giving them a second opportunity, 
Yep. Uh, they might be back, but you know what? They might not. Yep. But by following up with them, you increase that likelihood. And so again, bringing awareness to these approaches uh, with churches, but also in, in business, we've helped uh, several franchise uh, retail chains um, get a better understanding of their corporate policies, but also uh, their, uh, their staff that they have there, how can they communicate these things to them and, and really uh, take hold of that culture they want to create and sustain. And so that's something that our group does. And so anytime you're raising that level of excellence, it's increasing the health. And I believe that has an impact on the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God flourishes on health. It's yeah. life or death. All right. So which one demonstrates life? Which one demonstrates death? By doing nothing or doing the wrong things, you're going to die at some point. Yes. Uh, by doing healthy things, you not only sustain life for this generation, but you're leaving a legacy. You're sustaining that organization for generations to come. Wow. Amen. Wow. Okay. And so obviously the whole point of this show is we want to find who are the kingdom of entrepreneurs that are actually living it. They're for the, the, the principles of the gospel, the kingdom of God, and they are um, walking out their faith through entrepreneurial means, or they have a product or service or a business that is out there getting things done. And so um, uh, we're obviously going to have your, your, your contact information posted with this video. Um, is there, there any advice that you would give to the potential customer that would, or, or, or any kind of, let's say, what are the signs that are important for the people that need your service? You know, what, what are the symptoms, so to speak? So that's a loaded question. So I'll start off with the first part there. What advice would I give? Um, there are riches in the niches, hmm. all right? And that means that if you are, are shotgun spread, if you're trying to do 10 million different things, or at the, if you are doing even just one thing for a million different markets, it's a lot harder to make a living on that because you're not concentrated enough. You're not focused. And so what we've done is we've tried to branch out in the way of subcategories. And so we'll break down what we do, and we have certain markets we'll apply that towards. So our two biggest markets right now are churches, but also being here in Myrtle Beach, what we have found is we are really getting a lot of traction in the hospitality industry. Oh, yeah. So a lot of hotels and resorts and restaurants uh, we've been engaging with. Um, so again, it's something where, again, I, I try not to take what we do and, and do it just for anybody. Okay. One, that's hard to nail down from a marketing perspective. Okay. You really have to uh, determine who you're trying to reach uh, before uh, you even launch, before you even get out there. Uh, because without that, you're going to be unfocused and you're not going to like the results. You're not going to be able to be effective. Uh, and so there was a learning process even for me that I started off just being very generic when I started in 2015, basically anybody and everybody that would have me, I would go speak at their function or I would do uh, a leadership training workshop or something like that. All well-meaning stuff. Uh, but again, I wasn't getting consistency. Yeah. Okay. So again, my advice to any entrepreneur is find something uh, that is your niche, that is your area, that is your single approach. And uh, the more you can narrow that down, the better. And if, if it's really where, again, you have a certain set of skills and, and uh, services, find a way just to bring that to just certain markets, okay? Now, the second part of your question, the itch is this, is that, you know what, what I've done for coaching clients is help them narrow that focus, all right? And I've had to do that for myself as well. I have other people speaking into my life of, uh, they have eyeballs on what I've been doing and they're reinforcing that approach with me as well. And so 
that's part of also this aspect of entrepreneurship is adaptability is if something isn't working, uh, you need to change your approach. All right. I've done that. And, and so it's where, uh, depending on trends in the, in whatever business or market you're serving, uh, depending on the economy, depending on a lot of different factors, you have to be adaptable. Yeah. And so I've been that, you know, going back to 2015, the economy wasn't as strong. And so I had to really have more value focused uh, services. Uh, today, with the economy being pretty strong, uh, you have other challenges in that now you've got other people uh, trying to do what I do uh, for these same businesses. So yeah. what you have to provide is not only value based, you have to have proof of concept. Yes. All right. You have to really show that you have gravitas in whatever industry and market you're trying to be in. So that's something where, again, the, the more you can develop on the front end, the more success you'll see on the back end. Amen. Amen. All right, sir. Well, we are at the end of the show, but is there any final words you want to share with our audience? Um, my life verse is Colossians 3.23, all right? And, and it applies for entrepreneurship and everything as well as whatever you do, do it for the Lord, not for man. And a lot of times we like to separate ministry and business when really what it comes down to is if you're excellent in your business, it reflects back on God if you are a believer and you're doing things really well. Amen. Chick-fil-A is a prime example of this. They're one of the leaders in customer service, all right? It's hard for even atheists and people that are on the other side politically for them to speak ill of Chick-fil-A, at least when it comes down to their food and their service. Yeah. And so it's where, again, um, it's also a biblical principle of, hey, loving your enemies, it'll confuse them, hmm. all right? And so when you're doing things in excellence as an entrepreneur, as a kingdom of God entrepreneur, but you're doing things with excellence and you're serving everyone well, um, it's hard for them to speak ill of you. It's hard for them to get truly a solidified uh, opinion in a bad way of you. It's really where I may not agree with them, but they do that well. Hmm. And so it's really where, again, whatever you do, whatever it is you're doing, um, do it well, but you're doing it for God. You're giving him glory in it and uh, he will prosper you for it. Amen. Amen. All right. It was a uh, wonderful having you on today's episode. And would you do us the honor of praying us out, sir? Sure thing. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for Stephen. I thank you for his heart for encouraging entrepreneurs, uh, small business owners, and everything in between, Lord, where he wants to see more and more people come alive mm -hmm. and for them to see their potential, for them to see that they have something to offer. Uh, but, Lord, they have to be disciplined. They have to find a way, Lord, to find a niche and break through the noise and for them to do it with excellence. So, Lord, I pray blessings over anybody that hears this. I pray, Lord, that the words, the conversation that we have today, Lord, it will penetrate hearts and minds. And, Lord, that we'll do everything we can just to give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chris Honeycutt. You have a wonderful day. And uh, I do hope we're going to have more of these because, man, that was amazing. Hey, thank <laughs> you. I appreciate you having me on. God bless. All right, man. Thank you for watching this episode of the KOG Entrepreneur Show. If you liked and enjoyed this episode, please go ahead and hit the thumbs up button to give us a thumbs up. Since you're here, you might as well just hit the subscribe button and then you can be notified of all the new videos and content as it is released. Thanks for your time and you have an awesome day.